I invite you to turn with me now to Psalm 27. This is one of the Psalms of David. We found on page 862 in your Pew Bibles. 862, this is Psalm 27. And we'll read the entirety of it together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear you. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. Amen. It wasn't specifically tied to this text, but I found that an encouraging psalm. So let us keep that one in mind this week. Our main text for today, the epistle text, is from Philippians chapter 3. And we'll be reading the entirety of of chapter 3. It's normally broken up into sections here. Um, But we'll read all of chapter 3 and into verse 1 of chapter 4, which of course we'll read again next week. Um, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, um, but in your pew Bibles you can find it on page 1826. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, 
Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if any of you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord for today. There's a lot here, which is probably why they normally split it up, but most of it, this is one long thought here of Paul's. Rejoice in the Lord. He's giving his... We get the final, final exhortations next week. But he's been telling us to have unity. or telling the Philippians, but us as well, to have unity, to be humble as Christ is humble. To have Christ as our example and that we will shine as the light of the gospel through our lives. That God's word will shine in this world, in the darkness. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And I think most, every lectionary text I looked up skipped these first few verses because they don't know what to do with them. (laughs) When it says, to look out for those who are evildoers and who mutilate the flesh. What Paul is talking about, and it's something that we don't really think about now, is those who were saying, to be Christians, you have to be still a perfect Jew. And you have to put your trust in in all the things that Jews have to put their trust in. Um, To have physical circumcision, to have all the laws of Torah carried out, to be kosher, to do all these things. And put their trust in that, and that all all Christians, when they when they followed Christ, had to do the same things. And Paul is saying, no, it's not just about the physical stuff. If it were, I would have been perfect. I would have been fine. It's not about physical circumcision. It's not about trusting in the physical things, in the ceremonies that we're used to. It's not about the physical trappings. And it's quite a strong emphasis here. It's an emphasis that we tend to lose sight of. But in the Hebrew scriptures, in our Old Testament, there is quite a strong word against mutilating the flesh. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to scar yourself. And so... (laughs) He's really emphasizing this, saying it's circumcision in putting your trust in circumcision, physical circumcision is a mutilation. He says we are those, the circumcision was to be a sign that you belong to God. And the circumcision that we undergo as followers of Jesus Christ is a circumcision of the heart. It is a cutting off of old things in the heart and we worship by the Spirit of God. It's not a physical cutting. We don't put confidence in the flesh and don't put confidence in what we do to attain salvation. As it said, if, if it were possible to put confidence in the flesh in what we do, I would have been perfect by these laws of Torah. I was 
the perfect Jew, and he lists all these things, saying, look, if this were okay, <laughs> I mean, if this were what we needed, I would have been perfect, but I'm not. So that's what this whole list of say, is saying. You think you can boast in the things you've done? I could even more so, but <laughs> all of these things I consider loss. Our English Bibles are very nice in translating that word loss <laughs> because Paul's words are in ter in more in the terms of excrement. They are nothing. They are less than nothing. They don't gain us anything when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to a life with God. In and of themselves, these things that are otherwise good don't gain us anything. All of these things that Paul could have held up to say, look, I'm perfect. He says, yes, I could say this, but all of that is lost compared to the surpassing greatness and worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. He had a absolute transformation of his life. And that's something that I, I know is still something God is working in me <laughs> to change my heart so that I also have this desire to know the Lord more fully. Paul had a complete life change, and it reads through. If you, when we read this, you can see his desire to know the Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, as excrement, as worth less than nothing, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, from following the law of Torah, from following all these things. We can never gain righteousness of our own that matches that of Christ Jesus. It's only through following Jesus. Not having a righteousness of, of my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ. And actually, the Greek here is, can also be translated through the faithfulness of Christ. Through Christ's faithfulness, through Jesus' faithfulness, we have righteousness. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul did suffer quite a bit. He shared in the suffering of Christ. May this also be our desire to have the righteousness of Jesus, the faithfulness of Jesus, and accept that. Do not try and uphold our good works, our following of the law, to say, look how good I am. And we tend to hold up Paul. I mean, we name a lot of churches after him, right? <laughs> and, and Peter. And say, look, Paul is the epitome of an apostle. Live like him. And granted, he does say here, live, live like me. Be, be an imitator of me, just as I am an imitator of Christ. But what does he say here? Does he say he's perfect? No. He says here he has not already obtained this. And in that, I think we can say, yes, let us imitate Paul. Because he's not saying, I am the perfect example of all things <laughs> because what he what the world would say is the perfect part 
where he was doing really well, he says, no, that's not anything. The doing really well in terms of God is following in the footsteps of Christ. Following in the footsteps of the apostles and being transformed into the likeness of Christ, which is giving of yourself for others. Being humble and not proud. Having developing the fruits of this the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. These things where the spirit is working in our hearts come out. That is becoming more like Christ. And we just read last week the example that Paul is trying to imitate as he calls us to imitate. Jesus is example of humility in giving up everything for the sake of the world. It's a hard path to follow. <laughs> Paul says here, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And he has made you his own. We don't grasp on to salvation and pull it to us. <laughs> Jesus calls us to himself. But he does call us to press on, to know him better, to read more about him, to pray together, to ask for his leading and his spirit. ask for his leading in our lives. Says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And my mom actually helped me with this one <laughs> in the rewording saying, those of us who are mature think this way. If you think otherwise, God will help you also think this way, eventually. <laughs> So if, you, if, if this is a struggle, God will help us. And that's encouragement. It just helps to have the rewording. <laughs> that God will help us become more like him, also in how we think. And let us hold true, Paul says, to what we have attained. Let us keep holding on to that and don't abandon it. says, join in imitating me, holding me as an example. And one, one thing I found interesting is looking at commentaries is they said, this is like, we're, we're, we translate that word as hold as an example or follow the pattern of, but it's the same word that is used in Greek for making a stamp impression. Now I do leather working and so I know is sometimes you, you make a true impression of the stamp, and other times it doesn't quite take. <laughs> you need to hit it a few times <laughs> to get the proper impression of the, of the stamp you're putting in. But so that that is a, a reflection. We are being shaped by the Lord, sometimes resisting, sometimes not so much resisting, into an impression of him. So he wants to, the Lord Jesus wants to impress himself on our lives so that anyone can see that we belong to Jesus, that we are being shaped to look like him. Now you may say, well, we all look different. How can we all look like him? It's the amazing thing that is only possible with Jesus and through his spirit is that we can all, in our different ways, reflect Jesus Christ. Because he transforms us. He transforms our hearts and our lives 
and we all make up parts of his body. We're not all an eye or an ear or a foot <laughs> or a toe or an eyelash. I don't know how big the body of Christ is, is, is large. It encompasses the whole church through all, all the ages. And yet, it should be recognizable that we are part of him. That we are part of his body. So we all look different. But when he has put his stamp on us, and that true impression on us, we will look like him. <laughs> despite being a different part of the body. And looking different on the outside. We will reflect him. And I think this next portion where he, Paul is talking about those who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ, I think he is talking about believers. But those who only say they believe, who espouse belief with their lips and do not live, because he keeps talking here about living, living out the call of Jesus in our lives and being transformed in our lives and in our actions. He says there, because otherwise why would he be crying? Saying this with tears, saying, they say they follow Christ, but in their actions, in their lives, they walk as enemies of the cross. Because they don't have their mind on heaven. So it's a warning. They say they're only thinking about earthly things. They're completely caught up in this world. But our citizenship, our living out our roles, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior we don't live as citizens, really, of earthly kingdoms. It's like, yes, we live here in the United States, but our ultimate loyalty should be to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is where our real citizenship is. That is where we belong and that is from where we have been sent as ambassadors. We are ambassadors of Christ in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have this promise. The Lord will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Putting that impression more on us. He will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Reminder that Jesus, the word, the one who made the heavens and the earth, is able to do this in our lives. It's not something that we're working to try and do. So while this can be heard as a pressure to do things to make yourself perfect. That's not what I'm saying. It is, and that's not what Paul is saying here. He says, let the Lord Jesus Christ transform you. Seek after him and he will transform your life and not just your heart, but your body as well. And that is a promise that we look forward to. And that is both for here and for heaven that he transforms us here and now. And we also look forward to being transformed completely into his likeness. And Paul's final words here of exhortation are, therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So let us stand firm in the Lord and look to him for our salvation. 
because he is faithful and he gives us his righteousness. Not a righteousness of our own, but his righteousness, which is way better than anything that we can do or say or try. But he gives us his strength to follow after him, to take up our cross, as we heard from Matthew. We're called to take up our cross, which does entail suffering, and to follow after him, to be imitators of Christ Jesus, and to look not only to Paul, but to others in the church who have gone before and imitate them, to say, okay, this is what being a Christian looks like. This is what following after Christ looks like. To be imitators of them and imitators of Christ that he will do his good work in us. He will bring it to completion for the day of Jesus Christ. And this is good news. Amen.